putting together quantum mechanics and gravity should tell us what, how to replace the notion of space-time. But this picture, while it very beautifully told us how to generalize the notion of space, how to, or how to generate space, did not tell us uh, where to get time from. So understanding where, where time comes from is uh, another uh, a very important open challenge. All right, so that was one set of questions. Now let me move on um, uh, to describing the second set uh, of important challenges, which is the question of why there is a macroscopic universe. Um, so let's go back to this. Uh, let's go back to this picture that we learned because of special relativity and quantum mechanics uh, that. Uh, the vacuum is exciting. We use a magnifying glass to see what's going on at short distances. We see that it isn't empty. It's roiling with particles and antiparticles, and so on. Um, now, that's, that's, that's a very important fact. It's an experimentally true fact. Uh, it has many, many consequences. It's been checked to death. Uh, I should have mentioned it, but this theory makes, uh, the, the, well, at least the specific quantum field theory that describes nature, exactly these kinds of effects of particles popping in and out of the vacuum allow us to predict uh, to, uh, to predict things about the magnetic properties of the electron, for example, that are accurate to 12 decimal places. So this is not, uh, this, this really works. So th this stuff is real. Um, but it does have a disturbing consequence. Um, the vacuum is exciting, but it's actually too exciting. Um, and it's really a very, very basic problem that has, uh, uh, and it's the same problem over and over again. It has a number of different manifestations. So let me, let me tell you, uh, let, me, let me tell you how it works. So again, this is a cartoon of what's going on. Imagine you have a box, and in this box you have a certain size of these vacuum fluctuations. Okay? So there'd be some char certain characteristic size of these energies associated with the particles and the antiparticles or anything else that's going on in, in that box. Okay, let's make the box smaller. A smaller box, by the uncertainty principle, has even bigger and bigger fluctuations. Right? So if you look in smaller and smaller scales, there's even bigger and bigger fluctuations. You may keep making the box smaller and smaller. You have gigantic size fluctuations, which should be associated, amongst other things, with some energy. Okay, so there, there should be some, some energy contained in these quantum mechanical fluctuations. That energy is huge. The bigger and bigger it is, uh, the smaller and smaller I make the size of the box. So this should, by all rights, uh, give you some energy density in the vacuum, which is gigantic. Uh, in fact, how b it looks like it could be infinite because I could make this box smaller and smaller and, make this en and just make the energy in each cell bigger and bigger. So the energy density looks like it's going to be infinity. Well, okay, uh, that, that doesn't sound, sound so good. Uh, well, uh, at least it's probably not true that, it, that it's infinite because we just finished saying that because of uh, quantum mechanics and gravity, I can't make, I can't talk about distances that are way too small. I can't talk about things much smaller than this Planck length, for example. But you would still think that you could get an estimate for the size of the amount of this energy by just making the box, uh, by taking it down to a distance that's comparable to the uh, Planck length. That would give you some estimate for the energy density in the vacuum, um, which we don't have to put in numbers. The only word that made an appearance anywhere here is Planck. So it would be Planckian, okay, some Planckian uh, energy density. In a world without gravity, the absolute energy of the vacuum doesn't mean anything. You can, uh, as you, any of us learned in high school, you can add and subtract anything to the energies, only energy differences matter. But with gravity, that's not true. With gravity, again, any energy, any energy density gravitates. And what we'd expect this huge amount of energy density to do is to give rise to some curvature of space and time. How big should that curvature be? Again, we don't need to do any equations. Every single word that made an appearance here was Planck. So the strength of gravity is set by this Planck length and Planck scale. This is Planckian. You would expect this curvature to be of order 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So just this naive argument, this back of the envelope estimate for the amount of energy density stuck in the vacuum would lead you to suspect that the world is curved to a really, really tiny size of around 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Or maybe that it's expanding really, really fast, but doubling in size every 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Okay. Neither one of those things looks anything like the world we see. This nice, big, macroscopic, flat universe, it's 10 billion years old, we can walk around in it, everything's fine. Uh, that looks absolutely nothing like what we predict from the simple back of the envelope estimate. So um, I used to say that, that so if, if you just ask, 
how much bigger is this uh, energy density of the vacuum um, than uh, what would be even roughly consistent with what we see in the world uh, around us, it's numerically around 120 orders of magnitude bigger. So I used to say that uh, uh, this factor of 10 to the 120 was the biggest uh, disagreement between the back of the envelope estimate and experiment in the history of physics. And then I realized there's no reason to slander the other sciences. I don't think anyone has screwed up by 10 to the 120. <laughs> So it's really the biggest disagreement between a basic estimate and reality ever. Um, and it's, it's an attempt to answer a really simple question. Why is the universe big? We have a very hard time understanding why the universe is big. In fact, in the late 90s, uh, as perhaps Matthias will uh, 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 talk about, um, one of the most exciting experimental discoveries of the last 20 years is that the universe is accelerating. The universe is actually doubling in size at a uniform rate. And it's completely consistent. In fact, the best explanation is that there is an energy density in the vacuum, but the size of the energy density is 10 to the minus 120, <laughs> what we would expect from this estimate. So what we do, so I, I said this theory is wonderful. It explains everything. There's nothing contradicting it, and it's true. But what we do is simply the following. We say, aha. This is one contribution to the energy density of the vacuum. There is another one, and it just so happens that if, let's say, working in Planck units, this contribution was 1.784639, et cetera, going out to 120 decimal places, then the second contribution just so happened to be negative. 1.786, exactly the same for 120 decimal places, and then they begin to discrete in the 121st decimal place. That sounds completely nuts, <laughs> but it's actually what we do. Okay? That's what we actually have to do to accommodate this very, very basic fact uh, that, that the universe is big. It looks like a very fine adjustment of the parameters, accurate to one part in 10 to the 120, uh, in order to accommodate this very, very basic fact. This problem is so general that it has other cousins. They're not numerically as, as severe, although they're, they're, they're pretty severe. Remember I told you the reason the electron has a mass is because it moves around and bangs into this condensate every 10 to the minus 17 centimeters or so. OK, well, this condensate, like everything else, everything out there, it suffers these gigantic quantum fluctuations that are bigger and bigger at shorter and shorter distances. So there, too, that, 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 that condensate should, should have these roiling huge quantum fluctuations down at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. The typical length scale of the electron should be traveling should be 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Um, if that was the case, the electron would be so much heavier, we'd all be so much heavier, we'd all be black holes, it would be a horrible, un unpleasant world. <laughs> again, that looks absolutely nothing like our world. It's the same basic question over and over again. Why, when there are these gigantic quantum fluctuations in the vacuum, why is there any macroscopic world at all? Why do things look, wh why is there any macroscopic correlations that make any sense at all when, uh, when there's huge quantum fluctuations at very, very short distances? So uh, this is, uh, as I hope, uh, the, the, the second problem that I mentioned, we also address in our theory by taking two parameters and now adjusting them not in the 121st decimal place, but in the 33rd decimal place. <laughs> okay? But it's still equally ridiculous. It makes us think that we're missing something, something very, very big. Because the problem is so simple to say. So, so there's a very simple to say problem. It's not associated with some esoterica of the subject. It's a, it's a direct consequence of this union of relativity and quantum mechanics. Uh, but this direct union seems to make it naively impossible to have a macroscopic world unless the parameters are incredibly adjusted. Now, since the problem arose from uh, our union of space-time and quantum mechanics, um, it maybe stands to reason that if you're going to solve any of them, that you need some extension or modification to one of those two ideas. No one has ever managed to make any modification of quantum mechanics that makes any sense. Um, but, uh, but there have been approaches to these problems, and the only ones that do work, in one guise or another, involve some extension to our notion of space-time. They, they, they actually change and extend what we mean by, by space-time. It's a little ironic, because I told you earlier that space-time itself has got to go out the window. <laughs> what I'm telling you now is that before it goes out the window, it has to be modified first. <laughs> okay? So it's got to be modified in some way that's still recognizably space-time. Um, some with some extra bells and whistles, and then that whole thing is going to go out the door eventually. But first, we have, we've got to understand what this uh, modification is. Again, uh, really, there's, there's basically two ideas for what could be uh, solving even a subset of these problems. 
But the only idea that has a chance, and in some limit, actually does exactly solve both of them. It's not a limit that happens to describe the real world. <laughs> but it really have, has a chance to address all of them, um, is the notion of supersymmetry. Which, uh, which augments our uh, uh, normal ideas of space-time by saying that in a, if you want to label a point in this uh, super space-time, um, not only do you have to give a bunch of numbers, um, uh, a time, an event in seconds, and some position that it took place uh, in meters, but you also have to provide some other numbers which are not measured in using ordinary commuting numbers, but are measured using numbers uh, that anti-commute with each other. So numbers A, B, C, which have the property that A times B is equal to negative B times A. So these, these funny numbers um, have the feature that uh, A times A would have to equal zero. <laughs> That's going to be important in, uh, uh, in how it uh, ends up solving uh, uh, the problem. But very roughly speaking, the uh, picture is that uh, we have our normal dimensions that we know and love, three dimensions of space and one of time, but there's also some quantum dimensions um, and if we had an electron that moved in the quantum dimension, it would look, it's, it's a projection in our space, would look exactly like the electron. It would have exactly the same uh, properties, except in s some details what, what, what would be different. That this electron spins, for example, the spinning is responsible for why uh, uh, magnets exist. Um, its partner doesn't spin, so its partner wouldn't be magnetic. This guy's magnetic, its partner wouldn't, be, wouldn't have uh, um, wouldn't, wouldn't, be, wouldn't make magnets. Um, but otherwise, there would be exactly, literally exactly the same. If supersymmetry was a perfect symmetry of nature, then everything would be doubled. Once again, this is exactly like the antimatter story, right? There would be an extension to our ideas of space and time. Now, instead of putting space and time together to space time, we're taking space time itself and putting it together with uh, some, some, some new kinds of space time variable. But once again, uh, we, would have, um, we would have partners. Now you can ask, why is there only one partner? Why aren't there tons of partners? Um, if these were ordinary, uh, uh, some ordinary dimensions, you might imagine this guy can move in that dimension with any old velocity that it wants, and so its projection would look like particles that have many, many different masses. Its energy would change. So the projection would look like particles that have many, many different masses. Well, the reason there's only one of them is this peculiar fact that a squared is equal to zero. You can't take more